I am always pregnant, but will die at birth. I am never present for what I am worth, decays every day. I lure you away from feeling grateful for your life today. What am I? Future. You're the bravest person in the room. That is the hardest thing to do, speak first. I even told people over there to please speak first. <laughs> and they didn't, did they, Lisa? <laughs> what did he do that the rest of you didn't? Yes. See, you're a good audience. <laughs> you get this. Talk done, let's go have coffee. Yeah, that's... <laughs> but, Sorry, your name? Luke. Luke. Luke took a chance, more than the rest of you. So Luke said future, which is a really fascinating answer. What do the rest of you say? Nothing. 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 That's an even better answer. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> because what did I do at the beginning? Nothing. 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 At all. Just silence. What was I doing? Listing. Yeah. People ask me what do I do? And they think it's audacious or arrogant for me to say that I move hearts and minds. And you may think that as well until I say that I believe everyone in this room is capable of moving hearts and minds. Because Luke said future. And future is actually the most common thought that enters into your mind when you are given silence. You worry about the future. The second most common thought is that you feel shame about the past. Which means it's very hard to feel grateful for your life today. I'm always pregnant, but die at birth. I am never present for what I am worth. Decays every day, I lure you away from feeling grateful for your life today. I am expectations. When you're pregnant, what are you? When you give birth, you are no longer expecting. And if all you're thinking about is your expectations and whether they're being met or not, you are never present. How many of you have been in a conversation with someone where instead of actually listening to them, you were thinking about the next thing you were going to say? Raise your hand. Were you present? Fascinating, yeah? That's why I like riddles. Because I learn from riddles. When Luke says future, I'm like, wow, that just proves that our mind in silence goes to the future, yeah? And I like that. I'm not interested in titles where people call me artist or illustrator or poet or all of these things, yeah? Because with that comes a whole lot of expectations. 
I'm supposed to do something, yeah? I hope you perform a poem today. <laughs> you see? So it's very hard for me to like, make the most of a chance, yeah? Nobody noticed that just before the silence, I actually pressed play on my phone. That's because a song was supposed to play. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> so I had to run with it, yeah? Yesterday at Wired for Wonder, which is the biggest audience I've ever presented to, right in the middle of the presentation, a song started to play. Which is, to be honest, the thing that I am most terrified of ever happening when I'm presenting, yeah? Because I, that sort of a talk, when it's not chance, I rehearse morning and evening over and over again, yeah? And the last thing I want to happen is something to put me off, yeah? Because yesterday I delivered a 54 line poem. I've got to tell you, I was like shitting myself that I was going to remember that poem, yeah? And right in the middle, a song plays. And I was like, and I danced. <laughs> and I danced as if I had a tail. <laughs> the reason I did that was because no one can tell me I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> because no one in that audience has a tail. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care what you think. And I recovered. So that, that was really good for me because now I'm less frightened of the talks that I have to do now because that's happened now. And I know I just have to dance as if I've got a tail and I'll be okay. So, um, what was the other answer? You said future, somebody said nothing. Yeah, okay, so let's go back to that. I, I honestly, this year speaking took off for me. Beck, you're here in the audience. Um, Beck runs the drawing book now. And uh, we had a realisation last year that I was actually paying people to listen to me. Beck gets a salary. I don't talk to anyone else but Beck. Beck will listen to me because I'm paying her. <laughs> So I don't actually know if I'm saying anything interesting or not at all, yeah? Because she just keeps nodding. <laughs> and as long as I keep paying, she'll, she'll keep listening to me, yeah? <laughs> so I had to take a chance. I had to see if I had anything interesting to say by going out and speaking to public audiences. Um, Taking a chance is hard, yeah? It's really hard. Except for Luke. Luke's the only one in the room who actually doesn't find it hard, yeah? I don't know much about Luke. But he's less concerned about his... I believe he's less concerned about his identity than any of the rest of you. And I've noticed that the way we consume information and the way that we share information these days is not so much to learn as it is to reinforce our identity. Does that make sense? Now, what scares me about that is that if something disagrees with you, you view it as a threat to your identity and you either dismiss it or run away from it, yeah? And that, that's, that's a sad thought, yeah? Because it means that you're taking less chances, yeah? Because if you're just doing stuff that agrees with you, you're not taking a chance. Does that make sense? So, like, when I do a riddle and somebody says something which is really odd to me, that's the person I'm most interested to, yeah? Interested in. The reason is because that person perspective on the world is very different to mine. So if I listen to that person, my world expands. Does that make sense? But Google 
Facebook, Amazon, iTunes, will continue serving you stuff that agrees with you if you let it. People who li listen to this song also listen to this song. When I say this song, I'm talking about the one that I was trying to play. <laughs> <laughs> But you get what I mean. So you're just constantly being fed stuff that agrees with you. Which means your reality is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. My greatest teacher, no shit, is my 19-month-year-old son, Rip. The purest demonstration of why he is an amazing teacher is that he goes down the slide head first. <laughs> there are lots of other kids in the playground that go down feet first. There are other mothers who feel it necessary to interrupt my parenting. <laughs> <laughs> and say to Rip, you should go down feet first. And I'm standing right there. <laughs> and he still goes down head first. And I'm so proud of him. Because <laughs> he just looks at them like, why would I go down feet first when all the action is happening there? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what taking a chance is, yeah? So effectors was taking a massive chance, yeah? It was a massive chance because the world says that you are responsible for the way you feel. I'm not responsible for the way you feel. You are responsible for your reaction, yeah? Which is as if I could do anything right now and it wouldn't make any difference. Who in this room actually believes that? Who believes that no matter what I do, you will feel exactly the same way? No one. And yet, the English language does not have a word to describe an individual who is capable of moving hearts and minds. That's bullshit. I can definitely move your heart and mind. If I can't, why are you sitting there? You might as well be where you can find a good wireless connection, yeah? So the fact that we don't have a word in our language to describe that was a gap to me. It was a space of nothing. And that's the chance I took. I thought, you know what? I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say, yes, I think it's possible to move hearts and minds. That was in 2011. I launched Effectors in 2014. So what happened for those three years? Practice. 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 Diet, yeah. Diet. <laughs> Doubt. Doubt. <laughs> I was like, diet, that's amazing. <laughs> like, <laughs> reality, expanded. Talk to me about diet. <laughs> what do I need to eat? <laughs> but I'll, I'll take it. Okay, doubt. Yes, doubt. Doubt definitely happened. Um, and I didn't overcome that doubt. Like, we all suffer doubt, yeah? And today, if I can give you a story that helps you overcome doubt, then I'll be happy, and I hope that makes you happy. So, 2011, my, I was a bachelor. I was living in a one-bedroom apartment. If you walked into that apartment, you would have seen my crazy handwriting, which people have described as a heart rate monitor and an erratic one, not a Zen master one, but like a crazy one. Poems written all over the room, books like open to chapters, 
because I didn't want to read stuff that I agreed with. Yeah? I wanted to read stuff that disagreed with me because I just wanted to expand my understanding of things. I don't know why I, this started, to be honest. Beck might be able to say. I don't, know, I don't know why it started. But I didn't want to follow someone's argument because that's what a book is. A book is an argument, yeah? And if you read the one book, you are following their bias. So I wanted to read one chapter from neuroscience, one chapter from psychology, one chapter from philosophy, one chapter from urban planning, and just keep changing. And I was consuming these books at a rate of six a week. I was sleeping about two or three hours. I was not very healthy at the time. My reality was expanding at a rate where I didn't actually know what was real anymore. And I met a young girl who actually, metaphorically speaking, and allow me to do this because I'm a poet, she grabbed my feet and put them on the ground. Six weeks later, I married her. Out of pure need. <laughs> But I, I remember when she came over to my apartment for the first time and I said, hey, it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> and she walked in and honestly looked like she was having an anaphylactic reaction. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, what the fuck is going on? And I explained the effectors concept to her and she was like, that's amazing, you have to do this. That wasn't enough, that was love. Still wasn't enough. Love goes directly to the heart, yeah, which is where courage comes from. So you think that would be enough, but it wasn't. As Claire said, the doubt was still there. Because of that word, identity. I was like, if I go out and say that I can move hearts and minds, people are going to think I'm soft and fluffy, yeah? And I don't want people to think that I'm soft and fluffy. I want people to think I'm masculine and hard. <laughs> that was the identity that I had in my mind, yeah? So that's where the doubt was. I don't know how people are going to respond to this. 2013, PwC asks me to be, I guess, the wild man in the dungeon. They, didn't, they no longer wanted to be seen as auditing and tax. They wanted to be seen as more creative. And they believed that by wheeling me out and letting me do my thing for an hour in a meeting that they would be perceived as more creative, yeah? What I wanted to do was make them more creative as an organisation because I believe that there's an effector in everyone. So I did the job interview process. I went through the whole thing. And then they offered me the job, which was more than twice what I've ever paid myself, right before Rip was born. How many people in here have kids? Security is a big thing, yeah? You're no longer living for yourself. It becomes harder to take a chance. That's where I was at. The reason I turned the job down is because I imagined in the future giving advice to my son, which was, whatever you do, follow your heart. And I would never be able to do that if I didn't. Nothing was more powerful than that. I never wanted to look my son in the eye and say, follow your heart and be a hypocrite. So, as far as a lesson goes in how to take a chance, how to overcome doubt, I don't like summarising stories because I don't like the fact that in high school I had to interpret the poem exactly the way as my academic minute reality teacher did. I like poetry because you can interpret it however you want. Like, the future is not the wrong answer. 
nothing is not the wrong answer. So is anyone willing to tell me what they took out of that story I just told? Did you hear that? Sorry, you did interrupt someone. <laughs> what was the first answer? I just said give it a chance. Give it a chance. Yeah, okay. I like this answer. I'm going to go with this one, but I wanted you to have, you know, <laughs> the opportunity. <laughs> Mainly because you used the question to answer the question, <laughs> which works in high school really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you say what you said louder, please? Be who you want to be and model what you want to model. What's most congruent for you. Did everybody hear that? <coughs> be who you want to be and model what you... What, model what's most congruent for you. What, model what's most congruent for you. Congruent. Why did you throw that in there? I love the word, but does everybody know the meaning of the word congruent? No? You, you know it. <laughs> no, no, I'm so good. You look terrified, so I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> Great, so something that's in line with your thoughts, in line with your heart, in line with what you do. That's exactly right, yeah? So it means that if I do a poem and I say I'm always pregnant, I help you, yeah? And why I'm doing that is because if you try and answer my riddle purely through logic and understanding of the language, which no matter how romantic the writer is, is still logic because it's obeying a system of noun, verb, adjective, object, action, yeah? In the right order, you understand what I'm saying, yeah? So it's a system. If I use my body and I use my tone of voice, it's a more vivid communication. Does that make sense? Yeah, so congruence to me is how you establish trust very quickly, yeah? Because if my body language and my content are at odds with each other, you, something will be uneasy, yeah? Does that make sense? There's a lot of people here saying, yes, I'm going to take a chance, and they're sitting here like that, and I'm like, you un incongruent audience, you. <laughs> but I think that's a beautiful answer, a really good answer. Um, and I was hoping someone was going to get me to this point, which you have done. Thank you. Lao Tzu said... When I let go of who I am, I become what I might be. He was so good at that, that we actually don't know if he exists. There are people that think he is a mythological character, yeah? We don't actually know that he existed. Now, what a beautiful demonstration of theory, yeah? So the idea of letting go of who you are, I think is crucial to taking a chance. I was talking to Lisa before, who's come here from Brisbane, and I was saying that thanks to Adobe, thank you, Claire, I was taken on a tour around Australia and New Zealand. My favourite audience was not Sydney. Sorry, I'm not one of those speakers who bullshits you. <laughs> My favourite audience was Brisbane. And I believe the reason for that is that Melbourne and Sydney were so busy maintaining their identity. Melbourne has this look and feel when it comes to being creative. Sydney has this scene-driven identity when it comes to being a designer. But Brisbane was like, I don't know what the fuck we are. <laughs> I 
And so whenever I did a riddle or whatever, they just were like fucking in there, yeah? They were just like, yeah, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I was like, you are just like Rip. <laughs> Diving headfirst down the slide. And after doing it, deciding whether they want to do it again or not. And that, to me, is the motivation for taking a chance, yeah? Do it. Then find out if you want to do it again or not. Don't think about it and decide whether you want to do it. Because that's academic. That's a theory. Do you get what I mean? And I don't trust theories. I only trust experience. Okay, so, I have created an expectation with this dice, haven't I? And I've got five minutes left, so I should probably do this. There's a whole slide presentation that I haven't done. You know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, we should use one of those slides, shouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. That one. Oh, wow. This is a hot, this, see that Ned Kelly thing? That was interesting, wasn't it? We're not going to do it. I'm not going to tell you what that was. <laughs> um, okay, so I looked at 20 archetypes. I looked for overlap in tarot and mythology and fairy tales and things like that um, to find the ones that didn't overlap. Yeah? So joker, clown and jester are pretty much the same thing. Yeah? But nurturer and mother figure are very different. The mother figure has a connection with a child and the nurturer or caregiver has a more community mind. Does that make sense? Okay, so before you go, I actually want you to practice letting go of your identity. So we're going to do that, yeah? I don't care who you are. I only care what you might be. So I'm going to, well, I'm not going to. Flynn is going to roll this dice because that way he'll give me more time. <laughs> <laughs> he'll roll the dice and whatever number comes up, I want you to think about what you're going to do after you leave this talk. So, person, action, object. That's all you need for a story, yeah? Do we all understand the rules of the game? Do we all understand that this is really boring if you don't participate? <laughs> so we have an agreement. Good. Roll the dice. 19. Monster. <laughs> So the monster is the opposite of the creator, yeah? In a childish form, it's the one that smashes the sandcastle. So, not Luke, because you've already shown bravery and you've already taken a chance. And not, sorry? Divya. Divya, because she's also taken a chance. Somebody else, please tell me, person, action, object, what you are going to do after leaving this talk as a monster. Not go back to work. <laughs> okay, so not going back to work. First of all, thank you for being the first one. Everybody else was like, no! And I was like, fuck! Really? We've just spent half an hour talking about chance and you still don't get it? Like, really? Just stick up your hand. That's a really good outlaw answer because you break the rules. But you didn't destroy anything. A monster is the Hulk. It's Godzilla, yeah? You destroy things. So somebody else, what are you going to do after this talk? Okay. <laughs> Isn't it good that you know that now? <laughs> okay. You played the game well, so roll the dice again. Flynn, just stop us when we've had enough time, because I'm just going to play this till the end. No, you did, they did the same thing. <laughs> what is the chance of that? Uh, I'm, I asked the quantum physicist from yesterday, but I don't know. 16. Creator. Oh, that's interesting. We went to the opposite side. Okay, so this is the creator. This is the person who creates something out of nothing. Making Thanksgiving dinner. Making Thanksgiving, oh, bit of a nurturer in there, bit of a nurturer. It's a Unless it's just for you, is it just for you? Are you going to eat Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> yeah. That's a lovely answer. Next, you, you get to roll the dice. Thirteen. Caregiver. Everybody wants to be a caregiver, come on, this is easy. You, you sound really good when you answer this answer. Buy a homeless man a sandwich. Could you do that after you leave here? Yes. Would it cost you anything? Yes. Well. 
It's all relative, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, yes, it would. How much would it cost you? $5. $5. So the, the cost of taking a chance is $5. Am I right? W will you do it? You will do it. That's amazing. <laughs> that is taking a chance. So I think we're out of time. So what just happened then? Roll the dice. Find out. Do it. Give a homeless person a sandwich, yeah? Try it on. See how it feels without the identity problem and you open up opportunity. Thank you so much.